Welcome to the Investor Empowerment Series radio show, empowering your real estate investing with techniques, opportunities, and information, minus the BS and sales pitches. Now, please welcome the host of the Investor Empowerment Series, Joe Mueller from the Tough as Nails Investment Syndicate, Joe Mueller. Hey investors, I wanted to give a quick insider opportunity to the listeners out there who are currently doing deals or just getting started and looking to create more financial efficiencies for the real estate business. Introducing Investors Title Services, a much lower cost option for procuring the necessary title insurance policies for your real estate transactions. Think about how much money you've spent on title insurance in the past on either your current purchases or sales, and think about how much you'd be savings if just a couple hundred dollars per transaction ended up back in your pocket. Well, now you can by optimizing the relationships that other investors have established that you currently need for your business. That's what we do here at Investors Title Services. If you're a fix and flipper, a wholesaler, or, or a buy and hold landlord, we specifically serve this small niche offering you the best deal on title policy insurance. Call 847-443-9676 today to learn more about how you can save hundreds of dollars, if not more, on your next title insurance policy. You're listening to the Investor Empowerment Series radio show. This is episode number 75 with our special guest, Joe Zikowski. Joe's a Chicago-based home inspector that specializes in working with real estate investors in our local area. Joe, thanks for being on the show today. Hey, thanks for having me, Joe. Absolutely. I'm actually pretty excited about it because uh, I know we met a few weeks back in that uh, that class, and I had never previously uh, ran into you in the past. And after hearing the, all the insight you brought to the table and a lot of the experiences you've had working with investors, I thought, wow, this would be a great guy to have on the podcast. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm excited, too, because I just discovered you a few weeks ago, and I binge listened all your shows in probably a week and now here i am on the show <laughs> that's pretty impressive isn't that cool how that works yeah awesome so what what i guess give me a little bit more for the listeners benefit you know what how'd you get into what led you down the path to home inspecting i mean were you originally in something else or investing or what's what's your story i know like nobody grows up thinking like hey i'm gonna be a home inspector when i grow up right <laughs> um <laughs> So I was, I was originally in construction. I did that for probably about 10 years. And then uh, back in the, the downturn that I'm sure we all remember so fondly, um, everything just dried up. And I got tired of being laid off and always wanted to have my own business. And I always was really very interested in real estate, real estate investing and all that kind of stuff. So I knew I was going to head in that direction. And then I thought like, hey, with the construction experience, home inspection was just kind of a natural uh evolution of that i guess all right and what uh i mean what's it take to get into that type of a business i really don't know much about it um honestly it's easy to get in and it's hard to stay in um sure kind of i mean kind of like being a realtor you know what i mean like it's a state license so you take your class and you maybe get a little field experience with another kind of more experienced inspector and uh you can either work for somebody else or go off on your own, but uh, it's it's a low barrier to entry. But if you're not good at it, you're not going to be doing it for very long. Sure. Yeah. So no. it's kind of, it's kind of one of those things. Sure. No, that makes sense. And you know, I called your office this morning to try to get a hold of you, and you had a staff in there. I mean, so you must have a pretty pretty good size operation running, huh? Um, on on the staff end, as far as phones and everything, yeah, we got some great people answering the phones. Um, as far as in the field right now, it's just me, uh, actually looking to change that this year and hire some people on, but, uh, yeah, yeah, we're, uh, we're definitely in growth mode here and it's going pretty well. Well, that's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Good for you. Good for you, man. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so how many home inspections good for everybody. do you, good for everybody? Yeah. How many home inspections would you say you do like on an annual or monthly basis? I mean, obviously it's, um, it's probably annually, slow months and busy months, I assume. I'm going to say as many as possible. I like um, that answer. <laughs> no, honest, we, we honestly, we, we probably average about, I'm, I'm going to say about 300-ish a year, depending. Um, 
it's kind of it's getting more and more of that. It's kind of getting to be inspe- investor inspections, which I love. Sure. But uh, yeah, that's that's about where we are right now. I'm kind of capped, just because in order to deliver the quality that people have come to expect, I mean, you can only do so many inspections in a day, just to make sure that you've got enough time to devote to each one. So we're kind of capped as far as that. But uh, sure. Yeah, we try to keep it at around 300 right now until we get more people on board. So you've got a background in construction, and how long have you mm-hmm. been ho- how long have you been home inspecting them? Like after like right after the crash or? Um, not right after because it took me a little while to kind of figure out what I was going to do and really make a decision and plow forward with it. But uh, I got licensed in 2010. Oh, okay, cool. So coming up on eight years now. Now, what what brought you what brought you into that real estate investing space? Because it Honestly, sounds, sounds like, I mean, you little, mentioned it already, but, you know, like you're, you're talked about investing. You, we, I know that's how we met as you're working with investors. So, yeah, tell me how that happened. It's a little embarrassing, but uh, when I was in high school, I was thinking it was my senior year in high school back in like 97. Um, I was sick and I was in bed one night at like 1 o'clock in the morning and I saw Carlton Sheets. Yes. On an infomercial at like 1 in the morning. So, I was like, hey, what's all this about? You know, I think I was working at a grocery store at the time for like four fifty an hour and doing something that could make me quite a bit more than that sounded pretty appealing. So I was like, hey, let's see what this guy's got to say. Right. So you bought the so course? So I got the course and, of course, didn't do a thing with it, but I read it, you know, and uh, it just kind of gave me the bug, I guess. So that's where it all kind of started. But I know just being in my world as well, like, cracking that cracking that nut to get into somebody who's like a known name in like the investor click well i mean well, how did you get to that point in chicago because obviously in 2010 you probably started with started from zero you, obviously you know about investing you know about construction and you know there had to be a turning point or a tipping point at some at some point on your journey that all of a sudden it's like yeah i'm, I'm working with all these investors or is it just purely like word of mouth one to the next to the next all of a sudden you're doing 20 for investors then 200 and it's it's built over time by word of mouth um i'm gonna say is it okay to mention somebody's name absolutely on the podcast here um so andrew holmes from chicago ria if I had to give anybody credit for me actually kind of breaking into the investing space as an inspector, um, I would have to give him probably pretty much all the credit for that. Um, I took the mastery class that they do a while back, and when we were out looking at some houses, he's like, dude, you should make a program for investors. And I was like, well, man, you know, I hadn't thought about that. It's a good idea. So I did. And then uh, he just kind of helped me out. He plugged me a little bit with his people and just kind of got me started. And yeah, it's just been uh, kind of downhill from there. Like as more people find out and more people use us and they find value, then it's just kind of growing. That's awesome. Yeah. Andrew's a great guy and, and affiliating with the right people. I mean, that's like anything in life, right? Surrounding yourself with the right type of people can actually build you up and help you succeed better at what you're oh, trying definitely. to do. Uh, and he's a great resource. So I guess what I'm yes, asking used, now, used, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I, I used to think back in my uh, my less wise days that it was what you knew. And it's totally not what you know. It's who you know and who knows you. So Absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely a good point. But I'm sorry, you were going to say. No, 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 that's fine. H- having the knowledge does is, is an important factor in that as well. If you have the knowledge... I guess a better way or a different way to see it is you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you don't know anybody to help you implement it, then it doesn't really matter because you still got to know what you're doing. Exactly. Um, right. Yeah. That gets, that gets you in the door for sure. But yeah, the people will propel you forward like don't tomorrow. Right. So the investor program, are you, you're, you're Illinois, Chicago land based. I mean, I assume you don't go, you don't cross state boundaries. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. I mean, like I'm licensed in Illinois, so I can only operate in an official capacity in Illinois. I mean, I've, I've consulted like, you know, in Indiana or Wisconsin kind of near the border, but I can't be an official home inspector there. So it depends on what you're looking for. Understood. And you mentioned that Andrew suggested, you know, putting together a program for investors. Is that like some type of an education thing or is that like a a spinoff of what you've regularly been doing as a home inspector? Can you kind of talk about that? Sure. Yeah. Um, So the program that we ended up putting together, um, we call it the investor walkthrough consultation. 
Okay. Um, and investors like it because it's a fair amount cheaper than a regular home inspection, and investors, you know, they like deals. That's what they do, so we give them a deal. Um, what the program is, uh, it's a full inspection of the property, so we're still going through everything from top to bottom, inside and out, and uh, the big difference is we don't produce a report. Okay. So it goes it goes from basically a state-sanctioned home inspection to more of like a, a consultation, I guess you would say. Um, what the investors tend to get from that, um, I mean, obviously, number one, they find out if they're going to buy a money pit or not. Um, we help them to find defects that maybe they wouldn't be able to see otherwise, just because that's what we're trained to do. Right. Um, so we were investors. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, finish, please. Yeah, no, newer investors particularly, um, they tend to get a lot out of it as far as education goes. Um, we encourage the investors to come with us, you know, walk through the property, take notes, take pictures, and just ask a lot of questions. Right. Um, we really we really help them to kind of tighten up their game a little bit as far as defect recognition and estimating repairs. Oh, that's awesome. So it, make, it, make, it makes them better at what they do from working with us you know it even carries into all the other stuff that they look at too absolutely no that's that's great so they're so by hiring you as a consultant then on a investor walkthrough consultation though they're not getting a hard copy report they're getting you for a couple hours on a you know monday morning or whatever breaking down the property piece by piece and you explaining you know what you're seeing and why it's important or why it's you know something to be, be, be make note of for example and they're and they're exactly. handling their yeah, own I mean, they, right they they get our undivided attention and i mean this is more about them evaluating the property and kind of coming up with an accurate repair list so that they can make the right kind of offer okay um, it really eliminates a lot of surprise from it so i mean they can be kind of a lot more sure of what they're going to make or if they even want the place so that's interesting cuz one of my next questions as you were talking i was coming up with questions here i thought you know is this so in a typical transaction, so we'll go a little bit down the beaten or off the path a little bit. On a typical transaction, you know, there's an inspection period built into the contract. And, uh, you know, during that time is when the buyer would hire your company, you know, on target home inspection, mm-hmm. you know, in a, in a, in a normal, we'll call it a, a regular transaction for a retail buyer. And you'd come in, you'd spend three or four hours, you know, Find, trying to find the needle in the haystack of an issue within the house, and you produce this report that would then get presented to the seller that says, hey, I found these 23 things that are a problem, and I'm looking for items number 7, 8, and 20 to be repaired because we think those are deal killers or whatever. But in this case, you're actually saying it's like a pre-contract inspection. Is that right? It, it, ends, up being, it ends up being that sometimes. I mean, typically it doesn't make sense for them to call us out if they're not really serious about the property. Sure. So either they'll do it right before they sign the contract or maybe they will have that inspection period where they'll just bring us in, but they won't get the report. And that's just going to help them to know what to offer basically, or if they've offered the right amount, if they want to adjust it. Right. Cause if they're okay, that makes sense because if they're in, if they're in that first five to 10 days of the contract and you come up with something that's going to be like detrimental to the, to the project, they can then say, yeah, I'm, I got I to gotta walk away from this unless I'm getting, you know, some significant reduction, for example. There's a crack in the foundation, and it's going to cost $10,000 to fix. So that's cool. Right. I mean, I, I'd, like, I'd like to hear more about your experiences working with real estate investors. And be, before you answer that question, you know, a lot of our listener base, it, it's kind of all over the map, right? But, uh, but I'm guessing, based on what I can pull from data off the podcast, that a lot of it is, newer investors that are kind of either just getting started or have maybe a year or two of experience, maybe a couple deals or flips or properties under their belt. I mean, what, what have you experienced out there that you would say would be probably one of those situations that's, that's noteworthy of that you'd want to talk about on the podcast. I mean, there's gotta be stuff all over the map you've seen. I mean, there's properties in deplorable condition all the way to pristine condition in our area. Right. And it's it's not so much the stuff that's in deplorable condition because I mean obviously anybody can see that but uh, it's it's kind of the stuff that's hidden right below the surface or maybe that's a little bit more subtle. Okay. 
that somebody without an untrained eye or without tons of experience wouldn't necessarily even know to look for, you know? Sure. Um, I mean, God, where, where to begin, where to begin. Um, well, let me, let me give like you structural, let me give you guidance on that. Uh, how, how about this? Yeah. What, what are the, what would you say are the, the top handful or the top three to five things that seem to go unnoticed by most investors or newer investors that you seem to identify pretty commonly that they could call out, you know, if they had a little bit more knowledge, they should look for maybe when they're first previewing a property before you even get there. Sure. Um, the first thing would probably be drainage issues. Okay. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's something that once you know to look for it, I mean, you can spot it in a second. It's so easy to spot, but you have to know to look for it. Um, I mean, things like, you know, downspouts that kind of discharge right by the foundation that build up water against the foundation over time. Right. Um, grading as far as, you know, is the soil angled away from the house or is it angled towards the house? I mean, it seems like a common sense thing, but newer people, they don't always know to look for that. And that's something that even though it's not destroying the house at the moment, can cause big deal damage down the road. Absolutely. That, not even a newer person thing, because, I mean, when I look, I, I'll be honest, I'm not... When I'm looking at a house that I'm going to acquire for whatever, you know, whether it's a flip or a, you know, a rental, I mean, I'm not really looking at the I'm not looking at the grading around the foundation to figure out if in five years I'm going to have water leaking into my basement. So that's a great point. Right. Yeah. And it's especially if it's a property you're going to keep. I mean, these are things that you'd want to be aware of, you know. Right. Because a lot of times these issues resurface after you've already owned the property and then it becomes an afterthought of, oh, now I have to do something about it. But if they would have known about it up front, they could have prepared or even had it fixed during that initial repair process in that property. Right. And usually much more cheaply at the time than down the road, you know. Right. After you finished the basement. Right. <laughs> All right. What else? Oh, so, uh so yeah, drainage issues, and then after you finish the basement, that turns into moisture and mold issues. So that's another thing too. Sure. Um, a lot of times we'll be looking at places that have finished basements, and uh, you know you can't always see then like the cracks in the foundation or the little subtle leaks that might be happening. So you have to have somebody that kind of knows what signs to look for because that's all you can really do is look for signs in a case like that. Right. So kind of the more subtle things. So I mean things like that too that are kind of hiding just beneath the surface that will kind of come out to bite you down the road if you don't know they're there. Mm -hmm. um, electrical issues. Um, some are obvious, but others not so much. Like some of the more obvious ones are GFCI outlets. You know, where do they need to be? Are they there? Do they work? That kind of thing. Um, some of the not so obvious things are, is there aluminum wiring in the house? Um, is there old knob and tube wiring up in the attic buried under the insulation? Uh, those kind of things are actually kind of a big deal and they can be quite expensive to fix. So it's definitely good to know about that ahead of time. Great point. So now I have a, I have a question for my own knowledge, aluminum wiring yeah. versus knob and tube versus what is it? Co copper wiring. That's what it's supposed to be. Or if it's, if it's, if it's done right. today, what's, what's, what, mm -hmm. I mean, what are the dangers of those aspects? So what's aluminum wiring going to be? Why is that a problem? And why is knob and tube a problem for, for a homeowner in general or an investor? So aluminum wiring that they just used it for kind of a short period, like back in the sixties, seventies. Um, and it's, it's only the single strand. Like, so if you look at an electrical panel, you'll see some wiring that looks like it's kind of braided and you'll see some wiring that's just like a single wire poking into the, uh, to the breaker or the fuse. Um, it's the single strand stuff that becomes an issue. And the reason that it does is because aluminum, even though it conducts electricity like copper does, it doesn't handle it as well. Like it kind of expands and contracts. And uh, a lot of times those connections can become loose. And then, uh, you know, you get sparking and arcing and that can cause fires. I see. And you mentioned. Um, as far as not. Yeah. That's what oh, I was yeah, going to go, go to. No, knob and tube. I... And the reason why I bring up knob and tube is obviously in our, again, for those of you not oh, the listener base that's not Illinois Chicago based, we we've got properties that are built in the late 1800s all the way through you know last year obviously and certain markets where investors like to play in we'll call it where there's inventory available at pricing that makes sense for an investor to flip or to rent out you know has a tendency to be an older housing stock 
um, if you're looking for like a little more of an opportunity or a deal. So you get something that's built in 1960 or even 1920, uh, very common in, you know, the Chicagoland area. Um, you know, why is like a knob and tube, for example, so such a problem? And you mentioned about being covered by insulation. I mean, how does that all work and why is that an issue? Knob and tube is pretty much about the oldest kind of wiring you'll find in a house. And, uh, it, there, I mean, basically there's no insulation on it to speak of any insulation that was on it has now probably been worn away just from time. And, uh, but what'll happen is, especially when it's buried under insulation in the attic, if it's live, you know, live wires, they get hot. And because it doesn't have that sheathing on it, insulation will just kind of retain that heat and it poses a fire hazard, basically. Right. And then you've got the, the added issue of a lot of times you can't even get insurance on a house that does have that live knob and tube wiring just for that reason. So that's an issue you could run into down the road if you don't know it's there. And is there anything that can be, so obviously you can replace the electric if you've got, you can replace the wiring in a property, which is a big project, as you mentioned earlier, if it's mm-hmm. aluminum or if it's knob and tube, is, is there any other fixes that you know of if an investor, and I've predominantly seen knob and tube in like garages and attics in these older houses. Uh, I'm guessing because in the attic, they basically have like one central you know, we'll call it splitter and all these, all these wires are spidering off of this central splitter in an attic and it's going dropping down into all the bedrooms and the kitchens and all that stuff through the walls, typically balloon frame. Ooh, there you go. Good mm-hmm. word. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, besides tearing it all out and actually replacing it with conduit or BX type electric, what is, there's no, is there any other fixes for that, that an investor could look, you know, kind of use as a, something to, to put a safety uh, safety precaution in place, or, or is it literally just you got to tear it out? Um, I mean, at that point, you really got to tear it out. Okay. Um, I mean, any, any, anything that you could do as a Band-Aid really wouldn't fix the problem. Sure. Um, I mean, the, the knob and tube, I would say at the very least, you would want it to not be in the attic, um, just because that's being covered with the insulation is kind of what poses the biggest issue with it as far as, you know, the wires catching on fire and that kind of thing. Sure. But yeah, you you just want to basically just tear it out and just kind of do it right. Right. It's one of those things that'll come back to bite you, you know? Sure. No, makes sense. That's, I was just wondering if they had some type of new magic, uh, you know, foam formula that you spray in over whatever's there and it protects what it protects the knob and tube. But in my experience, you know, not, not that I, not that I know of, I'd say I'm, I'm much knowing. I'm not all knowing. So there could be something out there, but not that I've ever heard of. Yeah. I haven't been, uh, I faced I faced knob and tube issues, and no one's had an, another solution other than tearing it out and replacing it with new stuff. That was the reason why I asked, and that could, that could really change the entire scope of a project when you're looking at something that appears to be a cosmetic or more of a cosmetic rehab uh, for, let's say, a rental on a single family home, um, and then you know you you have it inspected by your team, for example, and you find knob and tube. I mean, that could be that could sway your your repair costs, you know, incredibly into a much higher, you know, a, mu- a much higher expense that you weren't budgeting for. And Absolutely. Re- yeah. I mean, like big hidden mechanical issues can destroy your entire margin. Right. Exactly. Good point. Anything else that you can think of that might be something an investor would want to look for as they're acquiring a property? Probably. Um, <laughs> so in some of the older houses, too, there's uh, there's an insulation called vermiculite. Right. Um, so people that have been in construction probably are more familiar with it, but it's an insulation that uh, back in the day when they made it, like just kind of the, the mine that they mined it from, it got contaminated with asbestos. So there's always a chance that that particular kind of insulation contains asbestos. And in fact, the EPA suggests that any insulation of that type be treated as though it does have asbestos. Sure. Okay. So it, it, it kind of looks like, like little gold nuggets or little gold squares. Yep. And it's got the consistency of kind of like a sponge. Um, the reason I bring that up is because it's another one of those things where if they don't know to look for it, um, it's something that could come back to bite them because they may have to get it removed and replaced and all that kind of stuff. And that, that gets costly. Sure. Um, and just, as a little extra nugget, I guess there's actually a fund that the company that produced it has set aside to help people to remove it. 
Really? So uh, I'll be ha- I'll be happy to share that link with you after the podcast if you want to maybe put it in the description or whatever for people. But uh, absolutely, yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, there, there there is a fund for that. But yeah, I mean that's just something that can be expensive and time consuming as well. Uh, um, I would imagine is and and I've dealt with vermiculite myself in the past, and you know as a young 20 something year old, like, you know, having the stuff floating around in the attic as I'm crawling around up there probably wasn't a good idea. Um, how does, is there an age you range know, of a property where one would be a little more leery of expecting to see something like vermiculite in it? Um, you know, it really depends. I would say anything before the early nineties. Oh, really? If wow. you do see it, if you, yeah, if you do see it, anything before the early nineties, treat it like it's made of asbestos because it may have some in there. Um, after the nineties, they kind of figured it out and, you know, they've got a process now where it's no longer a big deal. Like sometimes you'll see it like scattered on the bottom of a fireplace or something. Really? Okay. uh, All right. Yeah. Like some, some of the, like the gas fireplaces, like it's kind of insulation. It helps to retain the heat a little bit because it's a great insulation. Okay. It's just the asbestos thing. But yeah, nowadays it's not a thing, but sure. Yeah, like everything, huh? It's like we, we, we use it we use it inherently for years and years and years, and then, you know, 20 years later, everyone hears about how bad of an idea that was. Um, right, yeah. People must have been really tough back in the 50s and 60s, man, all the stuff that they were just living with all the time. That's true. And those are the ones that seem to last that, uh, that live to be in the, the wee uh, elderly years of the late 80s and early 90s of their life because, uh, I don't yeah. know, yeah, t- a tougher generation, we'll call it. Yeah, maybe the asbestos is good for you. Who knows? We'll find out. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, we'll we'll change everything in ten years, and it all be we'll be putting vermiculite back in houses again. Um, all right, so those are some great points. I love that fact. Thank you for bringing that to the table because I know we can't we can't dive into all the secrets because you would have uh, you'd have all the investors crawling around in attics trying to identify uh, vermiculite. Now we don't want that or, or grabbing onto knob and tube live knob and tube wiring with their with a flashlight and not. Uh, an ungloved hand and nobody wants that. Um, yes. Back to your home inspection business and working with investors. Are you predominantly, well, I think the answer to this is yes, but do you work in other spaces besides just single family? I mean, are you, are you doing apartment buildings or commercial? I mean, what, what type of scope do you have as far as the practice goes with the business? I mean, we've done everything from, you know, a little one bedroom, one bath condos in the city all the way up to, Gosh, I want to say our biggest one was probably a commercial building, um, like a strip mall, about 21,000 square feet with an anchor store, like Walgreens and wow. all that. So, yeah, we, we pretty much run the gamut. I mean, we do little little residential all the way up to big commercials. So it just kind of depends on what you need. You know, and I, and I bring that up because I know there's investors that are always, you know, inherently we're all trying to grow our businesses, right? And Sure. To most investors, growing the business might be, hey, I did three or four single family flips or rentals last year. Now I want to get into small multi or even uh, we had our we had our meetup the other night and there was an individual there who was actually looking to go straight into like small apartment buildings, like 20 to 30 units uh, acquisition and having, you know, especially when you're diving into a, a new uh, a new classification of real estate like single family to 30 unit apartment buildings, you know, having you guys as a resource, I think it'd be pretty important. And I know there's a lot of practices in, you know, nationwide, especially in that multifamily space where investors aren't even necessarily uh, assuming that they know anything about the property. They'll, they might not even be from the area. So you might have a guy from Ohio who's buying an apartment building in downtown Chicago, for example, and they need like that resource out there. So you're, you're essentially could act as what I'd call like a boots on the ground on behalf of somebody in that case. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. And we've done that before. I mean, we've worked with out of state investors all the way to California wow. just for that very reason. Oh, that's awesome. So I, I have another question or two. What, what would you say would be the best advice you'd give to a real estate investor who's you know, really just getting started or, you know, you attended this class that Andrew hosts, you know, mastery, you know, you're surrounded by a group of investors that are predominantly trying to get their foot in the door in the, in the investing space. I mean, there's gotta be something you see consistently that you could say, Hey, next, before you'd make that move, before you write that contract, obviously they'd want to 
get you there to have you uh, complete one of your investor walkthrough con- consultations. But you know, what would you do if you're standing in front of the room of a hundred people? I mean, what advice would you offer? Oh, geez, probably hyperventilate. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's I know how that is. Lots of sweating. So, uh, I, I mean, in, in, in just general investing terms, or in ge- in terms of home inspection stuff. Either way, uh, both. Uh, I mean, in general investing terms, God, I would say, I mean, be educated, obviously, like don't be in a rush, like I'll, like learn the business, it's a business, so you got to learn any business that you get into, like you can't just jump in both feet and not know the terrain. Love it. Um, so I would definitely say, you know, get educated, take a class, um, read books, whatever you have to do, Bigger Pockets is a great resource. Yes, it is. Um, and definitely meet people, like meet people that are in the space and befriend them and just kind of learn what it is that they're doing, what works, what doesn't, because every mistake that they make that you learn about is a mistake that you don't have to make. So I I think that's probably the best thing is just get out to these meetings and just meet people. Dude, you just said something, you just, you just said something that's totally a huge takeaway. And that is be, I mean, your words were, be educated in the space before you just jump in. I mean, we don't want we don't want to cause analysis paralysis, but you can't just jump into something you know nothing about and then expect to succeed, especially without having some type of network supporting you. So, I completely agree and that's a great piece of advice for the listeners. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And you learn the business. The big the big the big stuff is easy for anybody to see, but it's little stuff like as far as knowing the terrain, I mean, like, you know, knowing what the market expects, like, you know, these windows are pretty good, but should I replace them or should I not? You know what I mean? Like that kind of a thing. Absolutely. So it's, it's the little, the subtleties where it's really kind of good to just know the terrain and know what's expected and have people to fall back on to ask questions, like you said. So yeah, definitely. And, and alongside with what you brought up about, you know, home inspection in general, something I always beat the drum about is building your team as a real estate investor you know, that could include attorneys and real estate brokers, uh, you know, contractors and, and not to be overlooked, of course, is a home inspection type consultant as, you know, like the, the service you offer as part of your team. Because once you once you get things really moving, I mean, and I, I'm totally guilty of this as well. You know, you're walking through houses, you're looking at opportunities, you think you know everything because you've succeeded, you know, five or ten times in the last year or two or whatever. But having an inspector on your team, I think, is, is something that every investor should, should consider because just because that sing, the last 10 single families houses that you, you know, flipped, for example, went successfully and you decide to expand your business into a new, you know, let's say a new area of your MSA or a new state or, yeah, I, I'm doing great over here in Chicago, so now I'm going to start in Milwaukee. I mean, it's a totally different animal typically as you cross geographical barriers so i just want to give you a little plug there for what you're doing because i think it's important i know a lot of investors have a tendency to be like oh yeah you know i was uh i was a carpenter for five years and now i'm doing this and there's nothing wrong with that but having a just having a second set of eyes on the property could potentially save you thousands if not tens of thousands of dollars if you're if you have the right people on your team yeah i totally agree and just to kind of take you back off of that um so the person that was a carpenter for five years, I mean, they're definitely going to have an eye for the properties that people that have no construction experience wouldn't have. Uh, but the difference between them and an inspector is an inspector is a professional defect recognizer, basically. Right. So to get us and a general contractor in the same house is going to be two different things. Um, the general contractor is going to know more about how to build and how to fix that house than I would. Okay. But I can guarantee that I'm going to find the defects that are in that house more readily than that contractor, just because we're trained to look at it differently. Right. So I think that's something that people don't always understand or appreciate, but I mean, it's two totally different skill sets. Absolutely. And uh, for the listeners out there, you know, I hear a lot of, uh, well, my brother-in-law was in construction or, you know, something to that effect and relying on somebody that, isn't really active in the investing space. Like for example, like Joe is, uh, who, who sees these properties day in and day out, you know, to the number of somewhere around 300 per year versus somebody who may be very knowledgeable in 
the construction space, for example, like, you know, like you brought up, you know, it's, it's two totally different, to, to, totally different examples of, you know, what you might end up with at the end of the day, as far as an opinion as well. Um, right. So, and they're both important. Sure. Absolutely. So maybe it's better to consider, you know, adding a home inspector to your team and having that contractor who may in fact be a family member or whatever, just be the, be the guy that is going to come in after you've determined, and you brought this up earlier, but after you've determined what your scope of repairs is going to be, because they might not be the one that's going to actually identify a problem. And, you know, you don't want to be stuck holding the bag at the end of the day when your contractor who might also be a family member or whatever, a friend, whoever, um, you know, can't fix something, didn't know about something or has to re redo or rehab against, you know, something that got damaged through a process like, a you know, if there was a drainage issue that could have been identified up front, for example. So I just wanted to kind of bring that up. So now I, I just, I got one more question for you, Joe, and then I want to make sure, sure we give out your contact information for the listener that's interested in using you directly. And it's up to you if you want to talk any, uh, costs or numbers, that's fine. Either way. Um, are you, uh, are you, are you reading anything right now? Is there any recommendations for books? I mean, I know you're still educating yourself in the investor space, so that's how we met. You know, what's, what's on your, what's on your nightstand right now? Oh, geez. Um, I'm, I'm a book junkie. Oh, um, nice. I probably got 20 books. I'm 20 books I'm reading at any given time. Wow. Um, I've got way more books than my wife would like me to have in the house. <laughs> um, yeah, I know right, right now, um, there's there's actually a bigger pockets book because you know they got their own little publishing thing that they do now yep. um, by a guy named Jay Scott who's yep. been with them a long time um, and it's a book I forget the exact name of it but it's the book about basically how to estimate rehab costs and that book is awesome yeah dude I think you hit the nail so, on the head it's uh I think it's called the bigger pockets book on estimating rehab costs pretty sure. Oh, there you go. <laughs> By Jay Scott. So there, I mean, there's a few there's a few of those that I've gotten a lot out of, but I mean, that one just as far as kind of what I do for investors, like that's kind of helping me a little bit to do it better. Yeah, get and a I, different perspective on it. And the cool thing about this, and this again, you know, we're no 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 bigger pocket sales pitch here, but they offer some great resources, and that is an awesome book that I also have as well. The cool thing about that book is, you know, let's say a problem is identified through the home inspection and you know, it doesn't really matter what it is at this point, but that book actually breaks down almost like per square foot, per yard, per linear foot, per window based on size, you know, what the costs of the material and the general cost of labor should be for an investor. So if they're trying to really come up with a comprehensive scope of repairs, uh, or scope of work for their contractor, they can have a better idea. So they don't end up getting screwed by, you know, a contractor who's hitting them up for way more money than they should. So that's a great point. Uh, great book. Highly recommend it to the listeners. So that's the uh, Bigger Pockets book on estimating rehab costs by Jay Scott. And that's a great uh, piece of advice. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, of course. And there's, there's one more book I would recommend to all the investors out there. Um, it's, it's a book that most home inspectors have. It's called Code Check. Really? Code Check Complete. Um, hmm. They have they have them for all the different systems of the house, like you know plumbing and heating and air and electric and all that. But Code Check Complete is the one that it kind of is like a little mini resource guide to codes as far as you know building of a structure and you know electric and heating and air and just it kind of really helps you to not only get familiar with all the stuff that you're going to run into in a house and how it relates to the international codes, right? But it also is a great reference just kind of a one-off, what am I looking at here? Is this correct? And you can just kind of look it up and see right away. So hmm. code check complete. I think the most recent edition is 2012, but right. uh, yeah, just Amazon it, you know, it's there. So that's international building code. That's the organization that publishes that or issues that data, right? No, it's, it's actually a guy that writes it. I can't remember his name offhand. I'm sure I, I should remember it because he knows a lot of stuff, but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it, it's, it's not like, published by uh, an organization per se, but it's just kind of a, a rehab specific or an inspection specific uh, summary of those codes that this person put together. That's really helpful. It's illustrated, it's got tables and it's just a great resource. Wow. Well, thanks Joe. That's another great piece of advice. I, I have not heard of that. Yeah. I think that's awesome. I have to look that up myself on Amazon. That's cool. Thank you. Sure. Sure. So for the investors that are in the area, 
that would love to give you a call and hire your team to come out so they can add you guys to their investment team, how would they get a hold of you? Uh, the best way would probably be to give our office a call. Uh, okay. That number is 708-274-7279. Um, alternatively, they can just look us up online on targethomeinspection.com. Um, I mean, you can get all the info there. You can book online. Um, wow. Or, I mean, if, if we've worked together, I give all those people my cell phone, too, so sometimes they'll just text me or call me or whatever. But, yeah, I would just call the office for now and just uh, make your appointment there. So that's ontargethomeinspection.com, and you can actually book online through your website. That's awesome. And the mm-hmm. office number, I just want to make sure I heard you right, 708-274-7279. Sure, right. Is that right? You got it. Awesome, man. No, I uh, appreciate you being on the show today. Awesome podcast. A lot of little gold nuggets we pulled out of this one. Thanks for taking the time this morning. And, uh, yeah, I, I, as a matter pleasure. of fact, I've got a client for you, so I'm going to be calling you in the next week or two. We're waiting on the contract to get accepted. But you're going to be uh, you're going to be the guy that I'm going to be referring my clients to in the future. So I appreciate you oh, taking right the time. I can't again. wait. Yeah, man. No, we'll do some business today. Uh, It'll be great. Cool. Uh, there's one one more thing I'd like to add, uh, oh, yeah. just to get a little bit more va- more value out of our service. Please. Um, so just kind of to get the most out of the inspection or the consultation, um, just a few quick pointers. The first one is be there. Um, <laughs> you, you don't need to be there for us to do an inspection of the property. I mean, honestly, we can do it all by ourselves, write your report, and call it a day. And that's still very valuable, but you're going to get a lot more out of it if you're there. Absolutely. Ask us questions, take our brains, kind of look at what we're looking at, how and why we're looking at it, it's going to make you better at what you do. Awesome. Um, be engaged, you know, like, like I said, ask questions, take notes, all that stuff, get as much from it as you can. You might as well, you're paying for it, you know, like let it, let it do what it's supposed to do. Um, the other thing, uh, utilities, you're going to get a better inspection if the utilities are on. I know it's not always possible if we're dealing with like HUD homes and that kind of stuff, but as best you can, you know, electric, water, and gas. Let all that stuff be on so we can test everything. And okay. the last thing is, if the house is empty, that's awesome. Because I've inspected some hoarder houses, and i got to tell you, we're probably going to miss some things because everything's covered up. So right. if the house can be empty, that's a big bonus. We're going to find more stuff. So just a few kind of ways to get the most out of it. Home inspection pointers. I like it. Yes. No, that's awesome. Thank you. And again, you offer a uh, investor walkthrough consultation that's kind of specifically designed around that type of a client. And I think that, you know, that's something that the listeners need to have as a takeaway as well, because what a, you know, again, what a great way to be able to have you walk through a house with them. They can ask questions. They can see what you're seeing. They can understand the property they're purchasing better as a result of spending a few hours with you. And I think that's great. So for the listeners out there, if you're looking for somebody that, you know, needs to be uh, or you need somebody that you could use on your side as a home inspector, I think uh, what I've learned so far from Joe and our and our couple of weeks of knowing each other has been pretty awesome and some great advice today. So give them a call, like we said, or visit them on the web at ontargethomeinspection.com. All right. Yeah, thanks, Joe. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. And that's all I got, brother. Thanks for being on the show. All right. Yeah. Yeah, anytime. Happy to do it. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Investor Empowerment Series radio show. Be sure to tune in next week for another empowering episode. We welcome your feedback, so please rate us on iTunes and Stitcher and visit us at www.investorempowermentchicago.com or tannisgrouprealty.com. 